We're going to turn to Zechariah chapter 4. We read the whole chapter. Now on this board over here, on your left hand side, you see Zechariah chapter 4 over there and there's a little picture there. As I go through the message, that's going to make sense. Until then, it's just a picture. So I'll read through this chapter, then I'll have a word of prayer and commence. Chapter 4 verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is waking out of his sleep. He said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick of all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereof and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Then the angel that waked me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I and said to him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which though the two with through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil, oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then, he, then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Let's please bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and constantly praise you, Lord, for your wisdom you give to us, your patience, and always operate to us in the area of grace and mercy. Help us, Lord, to, uh, at this point in time, let your Holy Spirit to speak to us. Help us to understand a very vital principle in life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The title tonight is The Power of His Might. In Ephesians 6.10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Now here, be strong in God's might. In doing so, put on the whole armour of God for spiritual warfare. John 15, 5, Christ said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So the power to bring forth fruit comes through abiding in Jesus. So we have the first, it's through the, uh, fa the Father's might in Ephesians 6, 10. In uh, John 15, 5, it's through the power of Christ. Then Ephesians 5, 18, and be not drunk with wine when it is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Be under the control of the Holy Spirit. For we walk, not, we walk by faith, not by sight. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we find over here we need the power of God upon us to achieve anything in life. In Philippians 4.13, regarding our testals and testings and trials that come to us, the Bible says, I can do or I can endure all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, Power to overcome difficulties in this world. They come from God, not from you or I. We walk by faith in God's word, not by our limited sight and our experience and our knowledge. It's a lesson we have to learn all our lives. God gave us skills, yes. God gave us strengths, yes. His ability, yes. All to be used under his control, not apart from his control. That's so important. He illustrated in Zechariah chapter 4. In the book of Ezra, we're told, as far as the context go, that when the, the captives of, uh, of uh, Babylon were going back to their land, they had a decree to go back there and build the temple. As they started to build, they had opposition from the Samaritans, and they continually opposed them until they finally, the Samaritans wrote a letter to uh, King Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and they said, These people, if they're allowed to build the walls, would be great trouble to the king because this was a rebellious city. Great kings who ruled over all kingdoms, received tribute of people, were in this city over here. It's a city that if you allow to be built, they will stop uh, paying tribute and they'll be separate to themselves. And so the king thought, well. So the king went and checked the history records 
about Jerusalem and found it, yeah, true, true, great kings and mighty kings did rule over there. So he made a decree saying, tell them to stop the work, finished. So the decree came, the Samaritans got it, and they run to Jerusalem saying, stop the work, thus saith the, uh, the king of Persia. So they stopped the work. 20 years went by. Jews are living in their land, building their own homes, growing their own crops, living a prosperous type of, type of life, and the temple lays desolate. So God sends Haggai and Zechariah, and they, this is in Ezra chapter 5, verse 1, and he sent over there saying, Tell the Jews, arise and build. Who are you going to obey? God or man? Take your pick. The law says man. God says me. Now, here we have Zechariah in his vision. This vision gave him the, an understanding about the strength and power that comes from God and don't fear opposition. So understanding the message understand, means understanding the vision. So if you look at the little diagram over there, he said, now in this vision, he saw a bowl, great big bowl. This bowl over here was going to be something that's going to store oil, like a reservoir. Now under the bowl was a seven lamp, a lamp stand. Now when they say candlestick, candles weren't invented back then, they were lamp stands. A stand, there'd be a little lamp on each side, on each, each, uh, each arm, seven arms, and there'd be, you pour oil into them, there'd be wick on one side. The oil was a fuse for the wick, or for the fuel for the wick. So we have over here a seven lamp uh, lamp stand and stood stood over there. Now under this um, from from the from the uh, bowl on top, reservoir on top, to the lamp stand, a pipe came down to every one of those lamps. Now that pipe connected the reservoir of oil to every lamp over there. Then we're told also there's two, two olive trees, one on one side of the bowl, then on the other side of the bowl. And with these olive trees, be a whole lot of olives, there were two pipes coming down, golden pipes. And what happens? Pretend those olives were, were got, they were crushed completely in the oil, coming out through the pipes, and they filled up that reservoir. So here we have a picture that a great big massive reservoir with the Bible talks about golden oil coming through these seven pipes into these lamps, keeping them fueled all the time, so these lamps can shine all the time. Now, what was man doing to make them shine? Nothing. Man did nothing. It was automatically designed by God. God designed trees to bring forth fruit. That fruit crush will bring forth a fuel to keep these lamps burning. So it's a vision over here saying, I'm going to show you something. You see this light shining over here that dispels all darkness? Yeah. Was that done by man? No. Purely, purely, purely by the work of God. So we have over here, the, by the way, the word uh, the Holy Spirit is, a, is the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Many, many times in 1 John 2, 20, the Bible says, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Acts 1, 8, ye shall receive power when? After that the Holy Ghost come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me. In Acts 2, 38, the Bible says, repent and be baptised, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're told very, very plainly, the Holy Spirit is given to us, and many times in the Old Testament, anointing one with oil is typical of blessing one with the Holy Spirit. So the message is this, addressed to the Zerubbabel, now, he was a descendant of King David from the royal line. And he came back from captivity and into Palestine and they were told by King Cyrus a decree, go and build the temple. He even told them, I will provide all the, the money you need out of the treasury, go and build. So they started doing the opposition come along and then they stopped the work because of the opposition. Now comes the, the decree from, uh, from Zechariah and Haggai. And God says over here, to accomplish his work, it's not by might of your power of your army. It's not by power, any human resource whatsoever, but by my spirit. When God gives a command to do something, God gives the resources and the power to do it. It's not us who have to run around and find what are these resources, what, are the, what is the power, what is the ability. No. When God says do something, he does the provision of it. When God sent Israel through the wilderness, he said go in the wilderness, where are we going to live? I'll take care of that. How are we going to do it? I'll take care of that. You just go in the wilderness. When he told the Jews, go into the promised land. But these people are great and mighty, much more, much higher than us. Sure, fine. More powerful, sure. You go in the land. I'll take care of all the details. So the Jews, thus believers today, are supposed to simply obey God's word. And he, through his Holy Spirit, will make sure things come to pass. Now, Jesus Christ himself, in Luke chapter 4, 14, the Bible says, Jesus returned this after his being tempted for 40 days in the power of the Holy Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all regions about. 
Christ ministered without the use of his powers as God, that's the independent use of his attributes, he ministered as a man fully dependent upon the Father, so the Holy Spirit was upon him, doing might through him. And we're told in Matthew chapter 12, 28, the Bible said, Christ said, If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Because they claimed he cast them out by the power of Satan. He said, No, I'm cast out by how? The power of the Holy Spirit. We read in the Old Testament many times, Samson, Jephthah, Gideon, Saul, the uh, Holy Spirit came upon them and they wrought wonders every time. Without the Holy Spirit, nothing happens. So God says plainly over here, Zerubbabel will complete the building of the temple. And this mountain of opposition, this decree from the, the Persian king, this mountain, I'll remove away and make a plain. I'll do that. Not you, I'll do that. And also... Um, you will go ahead and lay the, lay the headstone or complete the work of the building completely. In verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of his house. That was done already 20 years ago. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? You might see yourself as being very, very small, powerless, unable to accomplish God's will. Fine. But if God be for us, who can be against us? If God is there, who are you to say you can't do something? If God says you can, you can. How? Through his might and power. When Israel was at the Red Sea and God says, what do you complain about, Moses? Go forward. There's a sea in front of me. Go forward. Put forth your rod. He did that and what happened? Opened up. Did Moses open up the waters? No, thank you. It was God. All Moses did was obey. He did the impossible. Why? Because he followed God. That's the secret in life today. He said, living a mundane life, a carnal type of life, you live a life trusting God by faith and you do the impossible. I mean, you don't understand everything God will do through you if only you let him. He works behind the scenes in such a way you don't even recognise what's going on. You hear later on what's happened, but you might even notice in your own life. You don't know the many people have been affected by your testimony, their lives have been changed completely, are doing work for God all because of you. And you'll never know that. But he has done that and will continue to do that. The whole idea is walk with the Lord and trust in him. Now we turn to uh, Ezra chapter 5 and we'll see what God did. Ezra chapter 5. We start off with uh, verse 2. Actually, verse 1. Then the prophets Haggai, the, uh, of the prophets Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Idu, prophesied unto the Jews that they were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, he's the high priest, and began to build the house of God which at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. Now we find the Jews obeyed the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. Now there's still a decree against them. There's still the Samaritans watching them, opposing them. In verse 5, um, But the eyes of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them, the Samaritans, or could not uh, cause them to cease, till the matter came to Darius, and then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. They kept on, despite the opposition from the Samaritans, they kept on building and building to the very, very point where Samaritans wrote a letter to the king in Persia, saying, King of Persia, these people are building again. A decree was made by Artaxerxes saying to stop and they're building again. They reckon, they reckon that King Cyrus long time ago said they could. And so what happens? Darius got their letter, checked back through all the files and found out, no, he's a decree from Cyrus. Cyrus says to Jews, go and build your temple. And he's a whole lot of money to do it too. And all you Jews that stay over here in Persia that want to go home, give them money to help them out. So he endorsed it completely. So Darius turned around and said, let them build to all the Samaritans. It wasn't the reply the Samaritans were expecting. No way in the world. Also he said, you give them building materials out of the king's treasury, help them along, and give them all the animal sacrifice they need so they can sacrifice for me and my children and bless our children. And anyone who doesn't do this, let their house be torn down and <laughs> be made a dunghill. So I don't think Samaritans really appreciate the reply they got, but... They obeyed, 100% they obeyed. And we told plainly, at this point in time, verse 14 and 15, 
and the vessels also of gold and silver, the house of gold which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought them unto, into the temple of Babylon. The, those did Cyrus, king of uh, king, take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto the one to one whose name was Sheshbazzar, whom he had made governor, and said to him, Take these vessels, go carry them into the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be built in his place. So we find over here that a decree was made because they found what that um, that um, uh, Cyrus actually did give the, the, the decree to build the temple, and then um, they, they, they went ahead and did the work and they finished the work completely. Uh, so we find over here, so wonderful blessing. Um, chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, uh, gives the, 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 the reply at the end of this thing. The elders of the Jews built it and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, son of Edo, and they built it and finished it according to the commandment of God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And they, this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. It took them four years to build it. And for four years they had the power through the preaching of Edo, uh, from uh, Zechariah and through Haggai, four years of preaching, 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 and they finally got it done. Now, they could not, in their own strength, oppose the Persian armies, the few little Jews over there. And for them to say, well, let's just go and have guerrilla warfare and fight against these Samaritans and do what we can to try and overcome them. Sure, that's a human way of working things out. Let's try and kill off all the resources and like, like uh, Nehemiah, have a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand. We'll do that and we'll, we'll beat them off. Yeah, we'll beat them off. That may have worked for Nehemiah because that's, that's how God used him. It's not going to work over here. So over here you find something totally different. And the whole thing is this. It's not by your might, not by your power, but by my spirit will do these things. And when God's spirit works, he doesn't work the same way every time. He might work one way today, different way tomorrow, different way the next day. He won't do the same. Like when Christ healed. Sometimes he touched, sometimes he anointed, sometimes he just said the word. Sometimes you left the person up. I mean, what, what, where's, the, where's the, the common thing between all the rest? Jesus and his power. It's not the method he used. It's him. And the Holy Spirit uses different methods just to show us. It's not the method. You can't copy a method and say, no, do this method and make everything work out fine. That's witchcraft. Here's a certain formula. And you go and use this formula and bang, it's going to work. That's not with God. That's not with God. With God, it's an absolute method called trust faith in him now let me finish with psalm 144 verse 1 and 2 psalm 144 verse 1 and 2 blessed be the lord my strength which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight my goodness and my fortress my high tower and my deliverer my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. So this is, this is the wonderful description of who God is to David. He is his strength. He teaches him how to fight, gives him guidelines. He teaches him how to win the battle. He is someone who comes to him in goodness. He is his place of refuge, his high tower. He delivers him from all his trouble. He says, my shield protects me from all, all uh, opposition. He's the one whom I trust. He subdues all my enemies. He's saying, God does this, not me, not me, not me. God does this. So in every, every step of David's life, we see him, a man after God's own heart, trusting God and living by his strength. That's what you should do. Live by his strength. Don't think, God empowered me. Now it's up to me to go ahead with the gifts and calling he's given to me to go and serve God in my own strength. Use all my resources for his glory. Without him. Nah. Never without him. Always with him. If you ever have the opportunity of reading the, the, um, uh, the Spiritual Secrets of Hudson Taylor, just a small book like this. And um, the reason why I like it is because this guy in his life demonstrated someone in dependence on God. I mean, demonstrated it completely. First in England, before he went to China, he put God to the test. He worked for an employer who had a bad memory and forgot to pay him. Now, it wasn't the guy was miserly, he just forgot. That's all, forgot. And he said, God, if I go to China, I'm going to have to trust you. I'll trust you with this guy over here. He never reminded him once. He got hungry, he was nearly eating off, eating off apples and, uh, and bread, and that's it. He would not remind this guy to pay him. 
And the guy from just on his own would, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, he, he's the money you need. Time and time and time again. We went to China, he was being supported by the, uh, a mission in, in England, and he found out that mission was borrowing money to pay him. He thought, that's not right. If God was with them, they wouldn't have to borrow money. He'd supply it. No, no, I, I can't be supported by him anymore. So I wrote him a letter saying, thank you very much for previous support. Please don't support me anymore. He had no other means of support. Nothing. He just felt completely, completely, completely assured. God will take care of me. I don't need a human source to, ma to make sure that that comes to pass. God is my trust. And so he went through hard times, very hard times, but God always came through always came through and he was in the mission field for 50 years and when missionaries were coming in to China he said look don't look to me for, for support you trust in God come here trusting in God don't look to me I won't help, I won't help you a cent if you don't trust in God don't come at all why because that's how I came and if you won't come like me you won't survive so you make sure you're trusting in God then come otherwise forget about it and he was in the mission field for over 50 years and God gave him millions of dollars in, in, uh, in gifts of support, which back then is like hundreds of millions today. And he had uh, over a thousand missionaries come to China. And in the, um, yeah, he, started, he had uh, opened up a, a mission called uh, China Inland Missions. And so you just read a little book and see, you see what God did through him. You won't say, wow, he's a great man. No, no way in the world. You say, boy, look what God did, look what God did, look what God did. And it's fantastic, it's transforming. So you look at that thing there and you read about his life and it shows you there's a man who took God's word seriously and who lived by the power of God, not by his own. Let's bow for prayer, please. Loving Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for your teaching, how you're always with us and you want to be our strength and our power, our deliverer, our high tower, Lord. You want to be the one who is our shield and our help and defender. Give us the grace, Lord, to have the wisdom to see that we live our life through you. We walk through you. We, we, we power through you. We war through you, Lord, in every way possible. Just like the branch abides in the vine, we are to abide in Jesus Christ and trust in you completely for us to be fruitful. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for making the Christian life easy. We have to trust in ourselves. All we do is trust in you. And you will do the work for us. Thank you in Christ's name we pray. Amen.